In 58 BC, Marcus Aemilius Scaurus, an ambitious Roman politician, sponsored spectacular games. A zoo was set up in the circus, complete with an artificial lake for crocodiles and hippos. A wooden theater rose nearby, gleaming with imported marble columns. And on the campus marshes, alongside many other marvels from distant lands, the skeleton of a monster was displayed. The monster's bones were colossal. The ribs were taller than the mightiest elephant. The spine was a foot and a half thick, and no less than forty feet, twelve meters, long. These, it was proclaimed, were the remains of the beast sent to devour Princess Andromeda, slain by the hero Perseus. We don't know what the bones actually were. They may have belonged to a beached sperm whale. Or they may have been fossils, discovered by chance and associated with the only stories that seemed to explain them, the Greek myths. This video is a collaboration with North Zero Two, a channel dedicated to paleontology and anthropology. North Zero Two's video, linked in the description, explores the prehistoric animals whose fossils so fascinated the Greeks and Romans. My video investigates how those fossils impacted the Greek myths. So, without any further ado, let's launch into our first myth. Beyond the Roving Scythians, by the roots of the deadly mountains that guarded the passes to India, griffins prowled. They were massive creatures, with lion's bodies and the wings and beaks of eagles. When they weren't hunting in the wilderness around their windswept home, they were burrowing with their powerful claws, seeking gold for their nests. Near the griffins lived the Aramaspians, a tribe of men born with only one eye. Despite rather limited depth perception, the Aramaspians had no trouble seeing the value of the gold heaped around the griffins' nests. On moonless nights, they rode into the deserts where the griffins lived and quietly plundered the nests. If the griffins woke, they attacked the men killing anyone they could catch. According to classical folklorist Adrienne Mayer, the Greek stories about griffins originated in the foothills of the Altai and Tian Shan Mountains, where Mesozoic fossils erode from slopes of red stone. One of the more common fossils in this region is the Protoceratops, a small dinosaur with a festive crest on its head. Protoceratops fossils are sometimes found almost complete, occasionally near nests of fossilized eggs. Here, Mayer argues, are all the ingredients of the griffin myth. Nomadic miners and traders, seeing the bones and eggs, understood them as the remains of winged beasts guarding their nests, associated those remains with stray deposits of alluvial gold, and created a tradition that was eventually communicated to the Greek world. So, were Protoceratops fossils really responsible for the griffins? Possibly, but we should be wary of assuming a direct causal relationship. Griffin-like composite creatures had a long history in Greek art, and appeared centuries before any conceivable contact with Central Asia. The Greek conception of the griffin may have been influenced, more or less indirectly, by Central Asian fossils, but there's no way to conclusively prove a connection. In the depths of mythic time, the gods confronted a terrible threat, huge and terrifying creatures, snake-footed, with the primordial strength of their mother earth, the giants. Armed with boulders and tree trunks, the giants climbed the slopes of Olympus and attacked the palaces of the gods. Every god was involved in the ensuing battle. Dionysus swatted giants with his ivied staff. Hephaestus hurled missiles of liquid metal. Zeus struck down the mightiest giant with a thunderbolt. At last, after a titanic struggle, the giants were hurled down to earth, where Hercules finished off the survivors. The ancient Greeks saw evidence of the giants' fall all around them. Many parts of Greece have rich fossil deposits, from the Miocene to Pleistocene epochs, when mammoths, mastodons, and other oversized critters wandered the landscape. The fossils left by these animals were enormous. The biggest mammoths stood up to 15 feet, 
or four and a half meters, at the shoulder. Since the best preserved bones from these skeletons are often human-looking femurs and scapulae, and since the Greeks, who had not yet encountered elephants, knew of no living animals so huge, large fossils were frequently interpreted as the remains of fallen giants. The Greeks associated several places with the battle of the gods and giants, but thought the giant's last stand had occurred near Megalopolis in the central Peloponnese, where masses of prehistoric bones were embedded in deposits of lignite coal. The coal beds were combustible and sent up clouds of smoke when kindled by summer lightning. This, it was thought, was the terrible fire of Zeus's thunderbolts, still smoldering after many centuries. As in the case of the Griffins, we shouldn't assume that the Megalopolis fossils were responsible for the myth of the giant's fall. The myth almost certainly came first and shaped the interpretation of the huge bones. But, if nothing else, the Megalopolis fossils gave dramatic physical shape to the giants and their battle with the gods in the Greek imagination. And now, our final and most famous example. There were a few different groups of cyclopes in Greek myth, but the most notorious were the tribe of gigantic, man-eating, and generally unpleasant one-eyed shepherds who lived in caves on the coast of Sicily. In 1914, the Austrian paleontologist Otheniel Abel suggested that the Cyclops myth was inspired by dwarf elephant fossils. These remains belonged to populations stranded on Sicily and other islands by the rising sea levels of Ice Age interglacial periods. Since smaller animals were better adapted to the scarcer resources of an island, the ancient elephants of Sicily gradually became much more compact than their mainland cousins, eventually shrinking to the size of ponies. The bones of dwarf elephants looked unlike those of any other animal familiar to the early Greeks. Their skulls, about twice human size, were especially uncanny, with a huge nasal cavity in the center of the forehead. On a living elephant, this is the base of the trunk. But to someone who has never seen an elephant, it looks more than a little like a gigantic eye socket. It would have been easy for an ancient observer to mistake the fossilized head of a dwarf elephant for the skull of a monstrous one-eyed man. Especially when jumbled and half-buried, the rest of the elephant's bones could be interpreted in the same light. And since the fossils were often found in seaside caves, it would have been natural to infer that the one-eyed giants to which the bones belonged had been cave dwellers. The theory that dwarf elephant skulls were responsible for the Greek cyclops is appealing. It is, however, just a theory. In this case, as always, we cannot assume a direct relationship between fossil and myth. We can only point to the possibility of a connection, and remember that myths are seldom straightforward things. For much more on the fossils of the ancient Mediterranean, check out the video by North02, which is linked in the description. If you're new to my channel, you might also be interested in my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants, which provides more detail about the interpretation of fossils and many other aspects of Greek myth and popular belief. Thanks for watching.